Please welcome Holly Norton to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for that fantastic introduction. And thank you so much, David and Brandy, and my amazing colleague, Abby Kraus, for inviting me here today to talk about this. Um, I loved so many of your um, name tags in the audience. I'm about to make a confession, Scrooge McDuck guy. Um, I freaking love Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> and my greatest ambition in life is to write the great American novel of his origin story. <laughs> so there's no Scrooge McDuck in this today. I feel like it was a lost opportunity, but thank you for re-inspiring me. Um, the, there's one, there's a very lovely gentleman in the audience. I saw him in the fruit line and his, his little name tag says, my treasure is my wife. Aww. I know. And then I saw his wife's name tag and her said gold. <laughs> <laughs> so woman after my own heart, you guys are amazing. <laughs> um, it's really been fun to think about treasure and uh, to kind of explore the idea. Obviously, I'm going to be talking about what I think as an archaeologist treasure might be. Um, but as I was putting everything together and you know those like last minute like jitters you get where you like read over your script 9,000 times and I realized the question that I didn't ask because I was making some assumptions as we always do is what do you folks think archaeology is? And there's no wrong answers. But I'd love to hear that as we're also thinking about treasure. What's archaeology? Just shout it out. Understanding the past. Uncovering the past. Uncovering the past, excavation. Indiana Jones. Sometimes. I am legally obligated to have Indiana Jones in this talk, so. Um, yeah, so we think of ourselves as scientists. Right, and we use material <laughs> culture. I wasn't lying. Um, this is unlicensed, by the way, so nobody tell whoever owns this. Um, we use material culture to understand the past. Um, and usually, archaeologists have like a really tough relationship with the word treasure. It's it's really laden. Um, there's a lot of like colonial connotations. Um, and you do think about it as gold and as pirates and as cool stuff that somebody hid or lost. But it, it always has that value, right? It's, it's that gold. Um, it's the islands. It's, it's all these things. It's this guy and his golden idol. Um, so usually, I would tell you guys, I am not, I'm not a treasure hunter. Like, how dare you even, like, associate that with us? Um, but today I'm going to embrace it. Like, I am a treasure hunter. And I'm not a treasure hunter in the fact that I'm looking to exploit uh, historically underrepresented communities and steal their golden idols. Um, but what we do is we use material culture to try to understand the past. And this is where I might need to start using my notes, but I could probably riff off of material culture for a long time. Um, and material culture is important because um, despite what we like to tell ourselves, it's really our physical world that helps to mold and inform like who we are, how we interact with each other, how we traverse through our landscapes. Um, and so everyone has material culture. And for archaeologists, these material culture um, comes as artifacts. Um, and artifacts are all of our little treasures. See how I got there? Okay. Um, and unfortunately for you guys, I'm kind of like that boring archaeologist. Like I don't traverse off across the oceans to, you know, exotic locales. I'm the Colorado archaeologist. Um, and before I was like the mom of all archaeology for our state. Um, you know, I always worked in North America or in the U.S. Caribbean. Um, and I often study just regular people. I don't study the elites. 
And so they don't leave a lot of golden idols for me behind, but they leave other stories of their lives. Um, and I apologize for this. This looked much better on my home computer than it does on a uh, fancy projector. Um, and things are cut off a little bit down here. But this is from a book that's about 20 years old. It's called Material World by, by Peter Menzel. Um, and this is a book that is photographs of everything that people have in their houses all over the world. And so this is what I mean by we all have material culture. And we all have treasures that explain the story of who we are. And we can use those objects in really valuable ways to understand the people of the past. And it's often important to use those objects because a lot of people in the past couldn't or wouldn't leave stories about themselves or the written record about themselves. What's even more important is sometimes even the people who did leave a written record about themselves, um, it's wicked easy to lie, like in your little diary, right? Like we all tell ourselves stories about ourselves, about our families, about the people around us. Um, but our garbage doesn't lie. Our garbage oftentimes lets us know exactly who we are. So material culture, artifacts, um, getting back to the treasure, these little treasures that tell us these stories. Um, and artifacts can tell us lots and lots of information about ourselves, about other people, in lots of different ways. So somebody over here, I think this gentleman in the front, said that time was a treasure. Um, it is, and sometimes treasures tell us about time. Um, so these are uh, three artifacts. This little guy up here is a figurine of a woolly mammoth that was carved about 38,000 years ago. It's about 40,000 years old. This, if it wasn't cut off, you would see was from 10,000 years ago. This is from my personal collection. Um, it is a, a little squishy Ralphie that I got within the last year. Um, without knowing anything about the cultures where these came from, these little guys are like time portals, right? Like, you don't have to know exactly that it was, you know, 10,000 or 40,000 or six months ago. Um, but just seeing them, you automatically kind of begin to get that sense of time. I think it's also really fascinating and important to think about how long objects endure. The things we make last so much longer than the things we think. And they have impacts um, across generations, ac across countless generations. Um, artifacts also tell us where, and again, that can be like a a really intuitive thing without having to have a deep, deep knowledge of cultures. Um, so here is a replica of a Whedon Island, what we would call a Whedon Island ceramic, um, which would be a, a pre-European contact American Indian from Florida. Um, these are some fancy little glass beads from the UK um, from about 2,000 years ago. This is from upstairs, shameless plug. Um, this is a little bit different than the others because this is a mix of both pre-contact pottery and more contemporary art pieces out of that same tradition. Um, but it's still, they're all anchored in place. Um, and place is really important to archaeologists. And if any of you have ever found anything and like you've taken it to somebody, you're like, what is this? You know, I, I found this and I don't know. The first question we always ask is where? Because where an artifact was, where it was made, where it was transported to is so important. And it's part of the story, ultimately not of that object, but of the people who made it and used it. Um, and finally, and this is, you know, obviously the, um, 
the cheap books version of like archaeology 101. But objects can really tell us about humanity on different scales. So we can think about objects on the individual scale, you know, us as people, what they mean to our families, how we use them within our communities, all the way up to using an object to understand global trade networks or socio-political events. Um, as archaeologists, it can be hard to achieve the individual or even that, that kin network. Um, we're really telling stories and working on that scale of community, society, sometimes even big global questions. Um, and so to kind of explain the power that an object has, I brought my own treasure today to share with you all. Okay. So this is a bowl that's been in my family for a really long time, for a couple of generations. So my great-grandmother, when she immigrated from Eastern Europe, brought this across the ocean with her. And I don't know her stories, right? Like those don't stick to the bowl. Um, but what I know is that once it got to the United States, it started acquiring its own stories. Um, so she passes away, my grandmother inherits this, and it's just kind of a bowl. It's in our house, it's in her house. It comes out at Thanksgiving and Christmas and food and treats get heaped on it. And then my grandmother passes away and this bowl comes out and it's on the family table when neighbors and friends and people who are mourning her come over to the house. And then I inherit it. And so now this is my very special bowl and very special treasure that I share with you all. I see everybody craning their necks. It has a nice little chicken. We love chickens in my family. Um, but those are often the stories that we don't have. Let me go ahead and move along. So we're talking about um, objects and artifacts and things individually. And we have these stories that we're connected to. Um, when I die, and this ends up like in a landfill, there's not gonna be some note that's like, dear archeologists, I love my bowl. It's really special, love Holly. Um, archeologists will have really Please be careful. different Please be information. <laughs> oh no, I, I mean, I wouldn't do this. Oh, I knew it. I knew this is what we get as archaeologists. <laughs> you almost ruined it, man. Come on. <laughs> Don't tell Grandma. She's going to be mad at me. <laughs> so stressed out. I apologize to anybody who has to value this. Um, as archaeologists, this is what we get. We usually don't get the pretty, pristine bowls, no matter what we show you in the museum and, and what we see. But there's so much information in this, right? So there's not information about Christmas dinner or my grandma or how it traveled. But there is information about how it traveled. Okay, now I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so, ooh. As archaeologists, like what can we learn? Actually, this is even a big fragment. What can we learn from this? Right? And so there's lots we can learn. Um, we can learn that it's very sharp. I am. It's not the first time. I didn't even feel it. Um, we can look at how it was made, right? And so this looks like earthenware. Um, you can test that by licking it. I don't always recommend that in Colorado. Oh, totally earthenware. Earthenware is low-fired ceramic, so it's porous and it sticks to your tongue. I don't recommend it in Colorado because we have a lot of heavy metals for mining. Um, hopefully I didn't learn that the hard way. I looked a lot of stuff when I first moved here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can see the decoration, right? So lead glazed, hand painted, under glaze. Um, we can pretend, because I'm sure you guys have figured out this was not an antique bowl from my grandmother. Um, 
We can pretend that the decoration and the type of ceramic is unique to the burn region of what used to be the Czech, of Czechoslovakia. So we don't know anything about my grandmother, but we know a lot about this bowl that wouldn't have been sold in the United States. And so we know that an Eastern European immigrant who was part of the political social upheaval of Europe in the beginning of the 20th century emigrated to the United States, bringing this bowl with them, and in turn being part of a huge population that changed American society and culture. But we only get that from one piece of fragment. And so often, what we like is lots of them, right? So going back to that idea of treasure, the dangerous part about treasure is that concept like with Indy where he's taking that one golden idol that's important and valuable, but it doesn't really tell the whole story of whatever culture he's completely like ripping off. Um, what we do is we get all these little bits of artifacts and we call this an assemblage. And all these artifacts together in relationship to each other tell us a broader story and tell us a much larger story about the society and the culture that left that behind. Um, we never get the entire story. Um, and so this is also where archeology span uh, benefits from collaboration with other disciplines, with other creative people, with people who can take these bits and pieces of human detritus and imagine a bigger story. Because archeology span is always kind of like a 1,000 piece puzzle with a lot of the pieces missing. And they're not just like under the couch, right? Like the dog ate them, they're never coming back. So, you know, you really have to get a lot of different bits of information together to fully understand what's going on. So how do we find treasure? Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because I gotta tell you honestly, I think the finding of the treasure is sometimes way more fun than the treasure itself. Um, and so this is the part of the presentation where I tell you what I did on my summer vacation. Um, humble brag. Um, last month, I spent five days on a Yampa River survey with my colleagues at the National Park Service. Um, so for five days, we floated and camped down the Yampa um, and this is a reconnaissance survey. And for us, what that means is we're going out and we're relocating sites or finding sites for the first time. Um, sometimes in archeology, span someone can go out and they can find this cool site and they can write some stuff up about it. And then it sits there for decades and decades and no one revisits and you don't know what's going on. So as scientists, we have to go back out. We have to go back out on fun river boats like at summer camp and um, see if we can locate them again. Um, so this was one of those trips. Um, so this was kind of a, a quick in and out. Um, this summer was, it was a little challenging. It rained the first few days and so it was wet and muddy and some of us were a little bit more miserable um, than we should have been. Um, so it's day two. Um, there's this site that we've heard about, never been recorded, and the whole crew decides to go up. So we're also with biologists, and we're also with boat operators. So not everybody who's with us is an archaeologist. Like, we need lots of different types of people to ensure that these um, expeditions are successful. Um, also, it takes a lot of logistics, and so we bring other scientists with us. Um, or vice versa, actually, um, so that we can get lots of science done at once. And it's actually really cool. Like, I geek out with the biologists, like, completely about, like, bugs and things I've never thought about. Um, but we hike up to this site, and these are pictures after I've left, after we're headed back down instead of coming up. Um, but that's where the river is. This is about, like, 
an 800 foot elevation change over less than a quarter of a mile. Um, and of course there's like that one billy goat who's like running up and down the hill and the rest of us are like, just give me a second, it's okay. Um, so we're like, this better be worth it. This site better be worth it. Um, so we get up there and we're walking through the junipers and we come upon this cabin. Um, and this cabin is funky. So not just because it's a day's float down the Yampa. Um, technically, you can walk into this. How the hell people walked into this, I do not know. There are no roads on that side of the river for quite a ways. So even by like mule or donkey or horse, it would take a minute to get here. Um, these are juniper logs, which would not be my first choice to build a log cabin out of, um, but they're sturdy and it's beautiful. You can see that gorgeous masonry um, fireplace, which is like almost as big as the house. So still figuring that out. There's some local stories and lore that this was a moonshiner's camp. I'm not convinced, but it would be fun. Um, they put a lot of love and care into this place. This, which is hard to see, I know, is um, really thick plate glass. Um, and in the 1920s and 1930s, sometimes that would come out of um, automobiles, it was automotive glass, um, or it was potentially like a case. It's not window glass, and they hauled it up here. But it used to be part of the front door. And there's this little metal frame that it used to sit in. Um, so there's this site. And the park archaeologist starts measuring it and recording it. Um, and I start noodling around because I'm going to go look for cans. Um, that's my treasure. I love counting rusty cans. And you guys think I'm kidding, but I told you I was a boring archaeologist. So I'm wandering around. And all of a sudden, I hear, I found treasure. And I'm like, that's great, because I'm giving a talk next month and don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> so like, I go into overdrive, and I start running across the site, because the treasure might run away? I don't know. But I'm wicked excited, so I get over there, and it's Miss Jenny. And Jenny is really rad. She has grown up on the rivers out at Dinosaur, and she is one of our boat operators. Um, so another confession, water can be a little scary. And this woman like takes us through the rapids like nobody else. She's brilliant. Anyways, she also has an amazing eye for archaeology. So she's great on these trips. And so she yells, I have treasure. And we go running over there. And it's this item sitting on this rock. So before I tell you about this, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the site. So you guys saw the cabin, and you see this, and you already know I'm running around looking for tin cans. Um, I didn't find very many. I found a few. I found about five, which for a site like this is actually really low. I probably have five tin cans like in my backyard right now. Um, there's no ceramics. Nobody broke grandma's plate in like a fit of rage. Um, there's no broken glass. Um, the site's really clean, which is really weird. And she finds this. And we do not know what the heck it is. Um, it's about a foot and a half long. Um, the rod is really well made. It's probably like machine extruded. It's not pointed at this end. It's very much, um, it looks purposely broken off, not like somebody snapped it. And then this, this blade part, it's about three inches wide. Um, and it's weird. It's, it's completely asymmetrical. It's hand hammered, right? And we're like, what is this thing? And why is it sitting out here? Um, and then I snap a quick picture, and we hike back down the river to the river, um, and we move on. Um, and you might think that this is a really weird object to bring to you all to talk about like treasure and what archaeologists are using to like understand and to tell stories. Um, but I did a little research 
in anticipation of today to see if we could figure this out. Um, and we're down to a couple of ideas. Um, and the first idea is that this might be a debarking spud. <laughs> I'm seeing nods, so somebody does know a debarking spud. Yeah, you have to make a cabin. You've got to shave off all of that bark, um, especially from those juniper branches. Um, that doesn't seem exciting, but at the number of cabin sites that I have been on, I've actually never found a debarking spud, right? And this is a debarking spud um, that's handmade and that somebody dragged out. You guys, I cannot emphasize the middle of nowhere where we were, um, where somebody chose to live and to work and to do this. Um, but I was also thinking about it and some of the other ideas that have come up and it's those hammer marks that get me, is that this could be a farrier's tool. Um, farrying as in um, blacksmithing. And this, isn't, this item isn't perfect for either one of those, right? It is not an ideal exact specimen for either one of those artifacts. Um, but then what I've decided is why isn't it both, right? Like, you have so little material culture to help you navigate your world out in this place. Um, and I'll, I'll go back to, to this, out in this place, um, especially a century ago, um, that you would have to be infinitely creative. Um, and that's one of the things that artifacts really tell us and show us. And the story that we get from artifacts and material culture and the little treasures that we find and collect and hunt as archaeologists constantly show us the amazing creativity and ingenuity of humanity. And that's my only profound thought for today. Keep it going, Forrest. Keep it going. Oh. Keep it going.